LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and today we present part two of our interview with Tobias Churton in which we discuss his book Alistair Crowley, The Beast in Berlin, Art, Sex and Magic in the Weimar Republic. If you missed part one, you can find it at LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com. The interview resumes as we discuss Crowley's books and writing. You mentioned his books being under the counter I had a, a, a wonderful experience to look back on when I was first buying these books. I've got some paperbacks that were published in the printed in the 50s and 60s, which I treasure because uh, they're, they're probably relatively rare. They, they are 50s books, particularly. Yeah. And 60s, well, they all tend to fall apart. Which Do you know which books they were? Did you have? Um, you know I'd have them? to go and I haven't looked at them for maybe 20 years, but they're on Did the shelf. Did you have a favorite one? Uh, do you know what? I probably came to it too early. Because I bought several of his books in the mid '80s, and I found them impenetrable, and that's yeah, perhaps, yeah. perhaps not surprising. I was just a boy. Um, well, and- also a lot of these books, you know, I mean, they were incomplete. Mm. They, the the necessary editorial equipment that you need to approach uh, some of the books that come out under his name wasn't there. The, uh, you need there was an insufficient explanation. Seven seven seven, for example, his book of correspondences will be practically meaningless to anyone who buys it, thinking here's the key to magic. Now I can get going. It, it won't make any sense at all to understand the value of seven seven seven. You need to know a lot about the golden dawn rituals and and where are you going to find this out? Well, you can you can get Israel Regardi's condensation of it. That's a that's a good place to start. But you need to have a sense of Crowley's life and his biography. Crowley, these are like unauthorized. I mean, most Crowley books are bootlegs but from that period you're talking about, 50s, mm. 60s. People got hold of a mimeograph in those days, they called them in those days, copies, and they cobbled these things because there was no body collecting his royalties because the OTO didn't come alive again until 1971 mm. uh, after a period of 10 year dormant period after the death of Karl Germer. And Karl Germer didn't release much in the 50s either. Um, so, so there was a kind of free for all on Crowley in the same way that newspapers can did in his time and after say anything they like about him, however absurd. They said you know, he's got no reputation. As a judge said in 1934, this man hasn't got a reputation to defend. <laughs> now, the implications of that are unbelievable. You can say anything you like about him, get and there is no recourse. Now, it's only now with the growth of the study of Western esotericism as an academic subject, that some sort of rigor is coming in. And people are beginning to assess the real value of his work, historically, philosophically, and so on. But to people who've been brought up under the old regime, it's absurd. They can't understand. Why would? Why, why doesn't Crowley just go away? He's a, I, I mean, I, there was a piece in by Toby somebody in the... Uh, uh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he said, um, you know, when I was a boy, I I got into magic. And of course, I met into Crowley. This is the sort of thing you get very often, you know. Um, Crowley is part of, you know, my misspent adolescence. It's a bit like Jimi Hendrix. I'm I'm, I'm listening to Debussy now. I've got over Hendrix, you know. (laughs) Do you you get what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Crowley's supposed to be a kind of folly de jeunesse, and we can write him off, and he's of no real value, you know, because he was a bit of, he was a bumbling old fool, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People continually mistake image for substance and but though i have to say a lot of the problem is these books that were coming out in paperback in the 50s 60s and above all 70s unauthorized as it were unexplained and yeah you show the book of thoth to somebody who doesn't know much about it and crowley crowley's writing style at the time uh the lack of reference material editorial control of course they they come over as voluble and meaningless uh the, these books have, have been 
you know, now there is an effort. I think Bill Breeze, uh, the, the head of the OTO, is coming out with some very good editorially supported reprints of, of Crowley's work. But there's an awful lot to be done more in this field. Um, and we're so, it's, so, it's, so, it's got started um, but a, a long way off. And Crowley's work anyway at times is, is quite difficult because he was heavily allusive, as great writers in that day often were. They presumed culture on behalf of the reader. Um, I, I've got many books from uh, my ancestors, the period where the, the writer constantly falls into, not falls, rises into repeating Latin and Greek epigrams, presuming that the reader was educated. This is this is unthinkable today. You can't put Latin and Greek in a text that's meant for a high street shop uh, because it's not regarded as, an, as a requirement of the state education system that people should be uh, have a Renaissance education. They only need a vo what they call vocational uh, education, i.e. get a job. Um, but vocation, there's more to vocation than getting a job and a bit of money in my pocket, you know, so I can go out on Friday night and get the birds. There's a lot more. Education is, is, the, is the reminiscence of the soul life of the individual. It is to bring forth what has been forgotten in the process of birth, educare, to draw forth. Mm. Now, this way of thinking, which is basically Neoplatonism, which existed in our education system, if only in M, uh, sort of shadowy, but it was there, has now vanished entirely. So your educated quote person today simply is somebody who's got a, a piece of paper saying they took a, a sort of exam and, and that'll, that's good enough to get you a job uh, in the production line. And, uh, but, you know, it, it, I'm sorry, it, it, Alistair Crowley is, I'm not saying he's for educated people, but if you want to understand him, you've got to have a certain amount of education, yes. And it and there's nothing you can start that process yourself. My father did. My father left school at 14 and went into a factory as an apprentice toolmaker. But at a certain point in his life, he decided he'd better make up for that. And he started buying books, old books. In fact, he wouldn't buy one point. He wouldn't wouldn't read anything, I think, published before before after the First World War, because he regarded in many ways rightly that the best writing had been written by then. Um, and he introduced me to books. So, uh, yes, uh, Crowley was of a bookish culture, too. Um, and that's why these sort of comic strip versions of Crowley you see on the Internet are so, so depressing, really. You just sort of think, well, you, you know, you are what you eat in literary terms, too. If you eat cheap food, you'll get a cheap mentality. And the mentality brought to bear on Crowley is generally that it's a cheap mentality and often that of the journalist who doesn't like uh, the thought that there's something he doesn't know. Well, you only have to look at the newspapers. That's from... not, it's not snobbery. It's simply that you don't, you don't handle uranium without a certain amount of knowledge. You know? Yeah, yeah, of course. And you, you only, uh, ne never mind books, you only have to look at the newspapers of, um, say, the late... Crowley, of course, never read a newspaper. No, of course, but I'm just thinking I, no, about... No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that because I said that just apropos of what you're saying, Crow, Crowley's views on newspapers w would not make him very popular with the broadsheets today and they, perhaps they do know these views on this, so that's why they're so anti but um, he, he re definitely regarded it as mind rot you know read too many newspapers you will stop thinking for yourself you'll stop observing things because you've got too many given ideas well that puts an interesting spin on, on, on what I was going to say in terms of looking at the newspapers of the late 1800s early 20th century the language in there compared to you wouldn't see language like that now in newspapers today because people would be like uh, I don't understand what was being said here. So, you know, even something that was considered, as you say, mind rot by Crowley back then. Yes, would now be considered literary, liter yeah. have literary value. Yeah, exactly. True. But it's interesting you mentioned his, uh, his sort of dislike of, of, of mass media. When I was reading your book, I began then to think about how the Nazis came along and how they manipulated uh, propaganda. And yet I'd love to have seen uh, Crowley in the, in the modern media age because, you know, he knew the value of cultivating a character. I know he said he had no reputation left to defend, but you know he had a. People had an idea about him. He had a certain notoriety that went before him, and um, he, you know he understood the value of. Uh, I think he would have worked well in the modern media age. Uh, not least, for example, that thing I'd never heard before, which was most amusing, that when he staged his own death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's very true. He did. He did. He did try to play um, symbolist head 
surrealist head games with the media of his time. He tried. He tried. He was. I mean, he was. He was a bundle of energy. No, he would. He would give it a go. He wasn't. Certainly wasn't going to let the. He didn't just turn away from the media. I'm not looking in that direction. He was. It wasn't a snobby thing about it. He, he. He. Yes. In many ways, he was ahead of his time. His ideas of marketing, are very, very. His own advertisements that he wrote for his books, are wonderfully uh, Monty Python esque. His sense of humour was well in advance of the normal uh, at the time. Uh, his whole th- his way of thinking was, was was different. He was very much a man out of his time. Uh, some would say out of all time. Well, certainly part of him was timeless. Uh, that's the attraction, really, because when you get into the universal mind, you can study somebody from the past whose mind becomes vi- vivified right now, today. That's the point. We're not talking about an old thinker we're talking about the essence of thought itself we can we can reach it now and thanks to the efforts of Crowley you know who's left left his gems along with the other gems that the magi of history have left behind we have we have some light in our darkness otherwise it'd be very depressing wouldn't it well it would and uh I was also interested in reading the book, just the impressive amount of people he knew. And I know you referenced this earlier on, you know, if you have friends in certain places and it can help you when you perhaps need it most. Um, but, you know, people like Einstein, you referenced Aldous Huxley. I mean, there's this laundry list of um, impressive minds. Um, yes, they recognized they were dealing yeah. with a mind. Nancy Cunard said that to, um, I think, to John Simons or Gerald York. Gerald York, I think she said it to. He said, he, said, he had a mind. <laughs> You couldn't get away from that if you got to know Craig. He had a mind, you know. That's that's like an empire of, of thought, and and it, and it was a creative mind. It wasn't the kind of he didn't have he didn't have the need to mythologize in the way that say William Blake mythologizes the contents of his consciousness. Uh, Crowley did not do that. He resisted that temptation, uh, if it is indeed a temptation, and. Uh, his, his his thought is constantly cha- challenging. If you want the best example of that, I would recommend the Confessions of Alistair Crowley, which Bill Breeze is going to produce in a new complete edition because they it's been was very badly edited uh, by its previous editor. Not badly edited, but a lot of important material was edited out, and again, you didn't have the supportive editorial work done on it that it needed. Um, but the Confessions is just a great read. Get it, you know. <laughs> get it in paperback. Read it on the train. Um, it, it, you get a feel for the man's mind. It, it's a wonderfully liberating experience and positive one. Uh, but he doesn't he doesn't pull any punches where the nature of human beings, individuals, is concerned. And uh, as for political correctness, I don't think he'd use it for toilet paper. Um, the whole notion that there are things you shouldn't say or shouldn't think was completely alien to him. Beyond the idea of good manners, of course, where you don't uh, go out of your way to offend people. Mm-hmm. But where the where my uh, old forebear of mine said, the only thing worth contending for is the truth. You know, don't get into a fight over anything less. <laughs> you know, if it's if it's an issue of truth, it's worth you must say what is the case, not what you believe is the case. What is the case? If you can, if you are convincing enough uh, to to be able to state it clearly. Say what is the case? What is actually happening here? It doesn't matter whether people like it, whether you like it, whether it's unacceptable, unpleasant. Say it is the case. This is the case. This is happening. You may not like it, but it's happening. And if you know, it's this whole thing. Churchill's thing. The Americans got the message of Churchill more than I think a large part of the English people. They understood his wilderness years when nobody wanted to hear what he had to say about the rise of Germany because England was going through a period of great pacifism like today, you know, the, all war is over, you know, wear white, um, white poppy, you know, all war is wrong, so blah, 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 peace is right. Uh, don't, don't mention the war. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Churchill mentioned the coming conflagration was be, would make the First World War look uh, like a, a beginner's a war in many respects. And uh, this is the case. And some would say we're still fighting uh, that um, conflict in, in various ways. But uh, no, I, Ch- uh, Crowley's a man. If you're interested in the truth, Crowley, Crowley's an interesting port of call. You shouldn't avoid him. Just Just forget about all... The, the nonsense, the black magic stuff and the hammer horror films, which just Dennis Wheatley knowingly exploited Crowley's reputation. 
Crowley wasn't bothered because he knew there was a difference between him and his reputation. And as you say, from a marketing point of view, uh, notoriety helps. But in the end, all he had was notoriety and he was not happy about it. He did challenge this in a famous court case of 1934, where he brought a charge against Constable and Company, um, who got a crooked lawyer to represent Nina Hamnett, um, who'd written implied in her autobiography that um, a baby had disappeared at Crowley's so-called Abbey at Chefley. Well, mm. that baby that disappeared was, in fact, uh, the heartbreaking uh, experience of a miscarriage of uh, his girlfriend, uh, which broke his heart. And he was deeply, deeply hurt by it. He loved children. And um, the idea of a child dying, he was against abortion for this reason. Every child to him had a will to be. And um, that will must be respected as much as your own and uh, true will. And uh, But she made a, it was a casual comment. It could have been settled out of court, but they brought in a crooked lawyer. He lost the case. Um, and again, as I say, the, the judge said, well, you know, you're all you're all basically said you're always going to lose Crowley. You've, you've written too many things that make people suspect you. You've written some pornographic verse or I would say decadent verse uh, just after coming down from Cambridge. How many people today have done, you know, filth in their in their youth and it all gets forgiven and forgotten? You know, no, nobody wants the dirty washing hang, hung out when the 30s and 40s. But oh, it was in Crowley. It was open field on Crowley. Uh, uh, terrible. He did seem to court bad luck to some extent. But here we are talking about him and all the people who thought they were pretty bloody marvellous having a go at him at the time are mostly forgotten. They are footnotes to history. But we are having a sensible, you know, chat about a man who, when he died in 1947, I think Time magazine said. You know, thank goodness, good riddance, we'll never hear about you again. Yeah, well, quite. Here we are, you know, 60 years later. He's a damn sight more interesting than most of the cultural figures you can scrape up from today's cauldron of celebrity. Uh, given that you've written the biography, um, I guess from now on I'm going to have to start saying Crowley because you've been, all my life I've been, I've been <laughs> saying, saying Crowley. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's Crowley as in Holy. He wrote a little verse about that, you know, not Crowley as in Fowley. Crowley as in holy. holy okay, holy well, I, I feel kind of emboldened now to correct people going forward. So that's, <laughs> that's good. Well, you talk about all this image of scandal around him and decadence and everything else. And then pause to reflect on his life and what he actually did and said and wrote. Then you look fast forward to today and you look under some of the stones in some of the places of high power. And you look at some of the stuff that comes out. I'm thinking of Jimmy Savile and beyond. Yes, past the bucket. Yeah, it yeah, begins to put things in perspective, doesn't it? Really, this sort of wickedest man in the world. It's like, yes, yes. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. wicked. I mean, we must think of the word wicked as it might have been used in 1899, and you might say that Vesta Tilly, the the the, the cabaret artist, as it were, the popular actress. Um, she was wicked. Oh, wicked! And if you say, oh, wicked, darling, yeah, yeah, he's wicked in that sense. Doesn't you know he's careless? He's wicked in the way that the Carry On film of the sixties were wicked. Mm. You know, knickers. Yeah, that's all right. You know what I mean? It's, it's wicked in that sense. But unfortunately, this word "wicked" still connects today subconsciously with words like, dare I say, it, "wicker," "wicker," "wicked," "wicker," "witchcraft," mm. "wicked," "evil," "wicked," "Satan," "wicked." Every evangelical's uh, nightmare, you know, of. Of of a, of, a, of, a, of a weird cultish religion, people asked to do terrible things rather than confess to Jesus, and uh, you know. So, so Crowley obviously fulfills a sort of role in in the modern apocalypticism. Uh, they take him at face value and say, "Well, he obviously was the beast." Though they're never quite sure about that one because they still rather see the beasts. Beast six sixes arrival is still in a few years' time. It's always, you know, projected slightly ahead to get more followers in the meantime. But um, you know, Crowley clearly shows you the bad, the bad thing, and they, it's a, the bogeyman. I think Chris McIntosh said to me once, you know, every society has to have a bogeyman. It was Crowley's un undeserved fate to become that bogeyman. Um, can we get rid of the bogeyman? I, I hope so. In due course. I do remember that Jesus was accused of having a devil by his enemies and being a servant of Satan. So you know, eventually that was not 
uh, a viewpoint which was held about him and, and people then got even bigger and bigger ideas about his greatness. I hope it doesn't go from Crowley notorious to Crowley glorious uh, uh, and overly <laughs> uh, worship the, or put an imaginary halo around the man. Um, I think he's got some fascinating things to teach us. His, his thought is relevant. His art is relevant. His approach to art is relevant to us. And I think today, talking to my artist friends who paint for a living, scanty, but a living of sorts, uh, they would say that the interest in spiritual uh, stroke occult of word loaded, and I don't know what else to say, magic, um, Gnostic thought, uh, is growing. People are looking uh, seriously into these fields for liberating insights, liberating insights, pearls of worth, um, jewels of regard. And Crowley's part of that. I, I found him the most interesting 20th century Gnostic. Uh, I think you've got to go back. There are other great figures of spiritual mind of, of his caliber or close to it. Uh, I think you've got to go back to people like William Blake and Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin in the 18th century to find comparable genius. Um, he's well ahead, he's well above the mentality of most commentators today. They're not simply not capable of assessing him. Uh, they don't have sufficient knowledge. And what is far worse, uh, they don't want to have sufficient knowledge. I think somebody once said, uh, all this is, uh, to understand Crowley, you need to know an awful lot of things, but I don't want to know those things. Hmm. I remember uh, an editor said that in a, a Times Literary Supplement at some point, or something like that. You know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. I, if you want a nightmare, just watch the news, you know, but nobody calls that black magic. Mm, quite. But but it does put nightmares into people's soul. My, you know, people, the children are afraid of the world, growing up afraid of the world they're living in. Now, Crowley was a man who, who said, get out there, do your thing. Yeah, you know, don't be afraid of anyone. As he said to his son, Alistair Ataturk, he said, always behave like a duke and never be afraid of anyone. You know, just don't be afraid of anyone. Yeah, wonderful, you know, uh, proper attitude. I don't. That doesn't mean being surly and aggressive towards people. It's just, just, just you do your thing, whatever people say. You yeah, know, you have a, you have your internal access to God or whatever the highest it is that you can conceive of, or something you're going towards, or you're dimly aware of, or you feel some high thing, some light in your in your individual life. Listen to this, 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 this voice. Match it up to reality. Uh, don't uh, become separate from society. Um, you are, we are a part of the beast. You know, <laughs> we're all parts of the goiters on the face of the. I mean, how can you, how can you think about the word humanity today? You know, what does the word mean? I, I, is does it mean the horrendous murders, the criminalization of religion? Why they call it radicalization uh, at the moment of religion? I, I don't know. It, 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 it dig, that term dignifies these murdering people. Uh, it's the criminalization of religion because what they have done is they can, what's the word, they, they involve God in their murders. They implicate the highest power, the wisest and indeed most merciful power as they're constantly hearing. They implicate God in their killings and this is the criminalization of religion and that's what it should be described of, described as. And it is a, it is that's the basis on which we should understand it. To call people radicals makes them feel that they're they are cutting edge, you know, saving the world. Only yes. the radicals really care. Oh no, no. One thing that, that fasc fascinates me particularly is uh, what at one time well, what, what still gets called the new physics, but of course it's not anymore. No, it's very old physics. And it was it was getting pretty old in the 1930s. I don't know why they keep talking about quantum mechanics as if it's a, the, the revelation of the era. It, it is one of the revelations of the greater <clears throat> era, but it was all dreamt up by people, many of them who were quite romantic, like Heisenberg. It's just because yeah. it hasn't been assimilated into the popular consciousness. Most people don't know anything about it. I don't know about now, but when I did physics in the 1980s, not a word about it at school. Ah, because so, it offended Newtonian physics. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's why people still think of it as new, because there's never been more books and you know popular science 
material coming out now talking about it. Well, it seems to be, yes, you knew, you're right. You know why? It's because it appears to undermine the Einsteinian universe. And therefore, it makes it very difficult to teach kids one thing. And then at the end of it, say, well, of course, this may all be wrong. <laughs> it, uh, on the other hand, it's also been spiritualized by sort of Fritjof Capra tradition. So very loose things are said about quantum mechanics as if quantum mechanics proves the existence of God, which is a, a fairly ludicrous notion. We God cannot be put under a microscope because he is not an object of our knowing. We can only analyze that which we can separate and, and analyze, literally an, an analysis means to loose apart. Analysis, the Greek, means to split apart. You can hardly split apart a uh, spiritual idea. Well, we mentioned this because Crowley was, you know, we mentioned Einstein earlier and uh, uh, Schrodinger. Uh, Crowley was interested in this area because he understood, as he said, he had a scientific way of looking at things. But what really interests me and uh, you know, would have him as well is how uh, what would get, to, you know, under the banner of mysticism actually begins to overlap with some of the concepts when you're looking at the new physics, the idea that, you know, reality isn't what it seems to be and that, um, there, you know, the role of the observer and how the universe can be somewhat bent to your will and just all of that stuff again some scientists these days i mean they're still resisting that um but the more i think that this idea that the the human mind is is connected to the cosmos yes is the most dramatic inheritance from the world of magic and it is because it is an inheritance from the world of magic that that the mainstream so-called science resists it so profoundly um the Lord's Prayer says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Hermetic tradition says, as above, so below. In the whole essence of magic is, is, is the relationship between the here and, and the beyond. And this dimension human beings need. Now, whether we are under a phenomenal illusion of brain or whether the brain is a phenomenal illusion of mind, as uh, Crowley once said, which came first, the chicken and the egg. I think people need to feel free in their minds, uh, primarily in the first place. And from that, your physical liberties may follow. So, yes, the notion that we can affect the universe through thought, that somehow things that happen, quote unquote, out there are the result of changes in in the spiritual dimension of man. Very, very interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by the way things seem to happen almost at man's... It, I see a negative, a strongly negative side to this. I'll give you an example. I think we've become very preoccupied recently with asteroids the size of Manchester sort of colliding with Earth. And I'm sure they're f furnishing many a nightmare. I've had a few myself of what it would actually be like to look up in the sky and and uh, and such a, a, a thing coming coming down on you, like the Tunguska explosion or something, but greater. These are these are. There is this sense that at the moment in the 60s, when I used to hear as a boy how man had conquered nature, you know, because somebody had sailed around uh, the world. Uh, single-handed in in a yacht um, or because we had sent men in suits out into space and all the rest of it. man has conquered nature well of course not nature continually th throws something back at us far greater than we can uh, not conceive of but far greater than we can muster so i do think there's already a negative idea of the relationship between human mind the human fear and per perception of what's going on in the universe we weren't too bothered about the asteroid belt, you know, 50 years ago. It was uh, these things were sort of known about. Some scientists wrote about them. Black holes were actually conceived of in the 17th century by an English uh, mathematician who talked about what is now recognised as a black hole uh, in 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 the form in the science of his time. So, yes, there there is a kind of universe answers the questing soul but it also answers the fearful soul and uh, again this whole thing about uh, global warming and um, tsunamis and climate changes there seems to be a sort of relationship between uh, our fear and these events happening which is interesting and I'm, I'm not explaining this I'm just drawing attention to it as we're losing our spiritual compass, it seems we're becoming more beset by natural forces. 
as man is thinking of himself in the Dawkins terms as a sort of genetic phenomenon uh, with a, of no greater value than what he feels he might be worth to somebody, you know, have a nice life. Um, as we're losing the, the magnitude of man as man in touch with the universe, uh, as a cosmic being, as Paracelsus taught and the magical Gnostic tradition maintains, the that the dynamic which makes the universe possible is in every individual. The same essence is that created something we can't conceive of is in ourselves. Now, as we're losing that, as we're blinding ourselves to it, or finding very weak alternatives in traditional religious uh, obsessions where God is conceived in the most anthropomorphic terms, which are really do him no justice whatsoever. God is angry with you, you know, this idea that is a demiurgical Zeus hurling judgment spikes into, you know, that he's got it in for us because we're sinful. All this, these images of, of the divine, which are all limited images of our minds operating under limited inspiration and usually just inherited stuff. I heard it, so I'll believe it. Um, I think we are becoming victims of nature in, in direct proportion to the despiritualization of our minds. And in the world of the mass media today, this is a very dangerous phenomenon because what is the Internet but one vast rumor network? It's like living in um, the Archers or a village. You know, Joe Doe says in one street corner, oh, I think there's something terrible happening. It gets whispered down the line. 1,500 people think something terrible is happening because I heard it. Who would you hear it from? I don't know, but it's, he said it and it was I, and it was a big picture and I saw this picture and there's a picture of a tsunami. <laughs> and, you know, and the Internet is becoming kind of fear machine. It's not, I know governments don't like it because it has the capacity to tell truths as well, but it is becoming a many headed hydra and reflecting our fears as well as our hopes. Uh, we've got to watch this. It's a, it's a, it, if we have spiritual intelligence, we can cope with all this knowledge. If we lose that, we lose the balance, we lose the wisdom. Yes, the wisdom. If we lose contact with the dear wisdom and we start reacting to things, we're going to be in deep trouble. And um, people like Crowley remind me of just what it is to think for yourself. Uh, not just to have thoughts and think they're original. I don't know if there's ever been an original thought since uh, pre-Socratic philosophers. Um, we've heard it all before, frankly. Uh, it's, it's giving things a new twist, which is fun. And I think in art, we can do uh, novel things, uh, novel twists on old insights and, and delight ourselves with our creations. I think that's good. But uh, no, I think we, we need to, to watch out here with this um, fearfulness now, on the positive side, can I think my way to a better world? Well, yes, to a point. But if you do remember in the nature of things that your dream is somebody else's nightmare, every phenomenon creates its opposite. So if you have a scientific movement in the West, you end up with an anti-scientific movement in the East. And I'm using very simple, simplistic terms here. I'm just saying the moment you think you've got it, you've, you've got something going be prepared for the exact opposite to appear. It will. We had state communism. Now we've got uh, Islamic state. And what's going to be the thing after that? There'll be another bugbear. There'll be another dimension of, of, oppo of opposing dark force. It, it is the nature of things. The wisdom is in the balance and you don't get a balance until you've got a fulcrum. Now, traditionally, in true spiritual religion, your fulcrum comes from the eternal perspective. It's like the apex of the pyramid, and if you've got the apex, you can hold the two. You can hold the two contraries in some kind of harmonic balance, a bit like the old cathode ray tube, where the electrons rushing towards the screen, and it's kept from going left or right by the positive and negative charges. You know, you've got the, you've got to have this both. We're never going to live in a wholly positive universe. You know. The utopia of, of, of the 60s was never had a chance. Uh, admirable though the effort was and the best of it goes on. But uh, and has left a folk memory of uh, better poss possibilities in man. Um, but no, the it's in this world, you know, there'll always be this in this world alone. There will always be this opposing concept. I think spiritual 
knowledge gives you the ability to cope with that, not not cure it, as it were. <laughs> it's it's with us. It's it's reality, uh, but it helps to cope. Um, I'm always very struck when the American presidents are inaugurated. I think they they get a blessing, don't they, from Billy Graham or somebody, and I give him supernatural wisdom. <laughs> I always think, well, if you didn't have supernatural wisdom, you shouldn't be <laughs> you shouldn't be standing there. Yes. Why why would you think you could take on this insanely massive responsibility of power and influence? Uh, and that goes for any political figure, unless you have some supernatural wisdom for good sake, or something so wisdom anyway. And proven wisdom, uh, not just an, uh, a popular notion of the time. Well, you mentioned again this idea. You talked earlier about the myth of progress, or you know, never-ending progress, and this well, idea. I mean, you've got limited progress, obviously. I mean, it's quite clear that there's been some movement from Newtonian optics to to the, some of the wonderful things we can do today. Clearly, there has been. There are periods of progress, but it can all go. Right well, exactly, back. exactly. And I've said to people. You know, do you think that 200 years from now there will be an internet? There might be, there might not be. And they're like, "What are you talking about? Of course there'll be an internet. You know, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll go straight into our brains. It'll be even better." And what we're currently wrestling with, this idea you're talking about trying to cure something. You know, whereas Islamic State have to rule the world, or Western secularism has to rule the world. There has to be that we have to move towards this resolution where everybody's on the same page and we can finally be at peace. No, this and, will not. Go no, and the two of the things that uh, they've got the transhumanist movement. Now, with people like Ray Kurzweil and the singularity and all this, and that's part of the myth of progress. And the idea is that when we get there, everything will be okay and we'll jet off into space. This and is then, just apocalypticism yeah. uh, run wild in a, in a different guise. But it's, it, you know, somebody wrote, oh, many, many years ago, the future is a, is a convenient place to store our dreams. You know, instead of dealing with the burden of our dreams today, we, 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 we plonk them in the future, a bit like sleeping King Arthur in the hope that one day he'll wake up. This is this is no way to deal. If you've got if you've got something to say that's real, put it out now. <laughs> you know, get it get it going now. Don't think it's going to get better next mm. year. You know, we've no idea. We could, who knows? Uh, we, we you have to have some faith because to take any step, even even if it's an enlightened step, you've still got to have the feel, a fundamental feeling that putting one foot in the in front of the other isn't going to be your worst thing you ever did yeah <laughs> so we have faith in the future out of the now as, as john lennon sang in mind games and that that's that's good we should have some faith in the future but we shouldn't put it all in the future it's uh, we've got to realize our futures now well before we finish we should definitely say something about crowley's art and we go mm. back to his time in Berlin, which is... Now, that is my opinion. <laughs> that was a, it was, his time in Berlin, to me, it seemed... One, one thing that struck me going through the book was uh, the amount of sex and dinners. You know, they were constantly going to lunch, going to dinner, or having sex, you know, and amongst everything else. It's, you got something against it? <laughs> no, not at all. It's just that it was there, you know. But um, so he's working towards this exhibition, which uh, in my the back of my mind as I was reading the book, I started to call the damn exhibition because it just seemed like, when is this bloody thing going to happen? <laughs> yes. But it does eventually. But uh, you, you mentioned it earlier a little bit about, um, you know, that was designed to sort of um, – help his book sales but talking about his art in itself a lot of people are not even aware that he was an artist but um very interesting style there's a few reproduced in the book but you can go online and find you know lots of others um so well not lots there well, ain't so, that many actually to be honest i mean a lot of the material is still is still lost crowley didn't paint enormous amount of pictures i suppose probably altogether there's probably about 150 known pictures of which in existence well i mean I, I i was hoping that jimmy page would would help out with the um visual canon uh but he has plans of his own perhaps to do so this is led Zeppelin guitarist jimmy page in case well, he, he, he he owns an important collection of crowley paintings but and some of them he has allowed to be exhibited in london in i think uh, 99 um but there is no at the moment there's no catalogue raisonné of Crowley's work, and when we get that, uh, then we'll be able to assess Crowley as an artist, and in the full history of 20th century art, and he'll be rated as an artist then, and that will happen. I had the support with the book from the Stedelijk Museum, uh, Frank van Lemoen at the Stedelijk Modern Art Museum in Amsterdam, and that's why I asked him if he'd do me the forward because it, it is it, it is. 
there is still the notion that Crowley's art was somehow, well, yes, because it's Crowley, it's not art really, is it? You know, it's it's a bit like when John Lennon started having exhibitions with Yoko Ono in 68. Yeah, but he's a pop star. Kind of, you know, he's not supposed to put on gallery shows. He's not supposed to have lithograph exhibitions because, well, you know, we, we all knew he could draw a bit, but he's not an artist, is he? But of course, Yoko told him he was an artist and that everything he created had artistic potential, which is, is undoubtedly true. Uh, who says what is and is not? Crowley is an artist in the whole dimension of his being. He's not just an artist because he painted some pictures. He, he, everything he did from his early years was was the instincts and attitude of the creative artist who's taking his new materials and twisting them. I don't mean that in the negative sense. I mean simply uh, in the way that you would, like a scu you sculpt, he sculpted his ideas in literary form. He didn't start painting until 1919, but within two years he'd had, had uh, not 1919, but he started painting in 1917, uh, almost immediately after the death of his mother, who also painted, which I think is very significant. And he had his first exhibition in, in New York in uh, 1918, and um, which was eventually put down by some ladies who complained that it was anti-Christian, which, well, you know, nowadays though, they would have drawn millions. <laughs> Yeah, because he'd have been a, a bet noir of new art, you know. Well, yeah, you think about you know, so they, not that I like their their what I've seen of their work, but you know, the Tracy Emin and Damien Hurst and that crowd. And well, they they're get... all they're all living on the borrowed capital of artists in the past who suffered ignominy and dis, being despised. The modern art world is now so afraid of dismissing a new a new artist in case they missed the missed the uh, ideological novel boat. Yeah, uh, that that obviously you do get the situation now where where uh, perhaps less significant historically artists get an awful lot of attention um, um, and other other worthwhile artists do not I mean that's always going to be a gripe you know if you get the crit you that's it you get the name in the books and it it it, it, it just helps to be to do something totally different I think where the two artists you mentioned scored was they did something that no one else had done and that arrests the attention. Crowley also was doing that, but of course, as usual in his case, <laughs> it didn't work for him <laughs> because it was Crowley doing it. So it was not, you didn't have to take his art seriously. Uh, but his greatest inspiration was Gauguin. And uh, that is, and he, he, he knew the company of artists. He'd lived in Paris for years. He, he knew the top artists. He was intimate with them. He, you know, who, who did Balzac, that wonderful, Rodin. He, he was a friend of, of Rodin. He wrote a whole book of poems in praise of him. He wasn't piddling around where art was concerned. He was, he was up with the top artists. He was, he was rated. Uh, Nina Hamnett, who was painting in Paris in the 20s, uh, commented in her autobiography that caused a scandal later, that his paintings were beautiful and that they, they had a remarkable sense of colour and that he was an original artist. Uh, the examples I've been able to get into the book uh, show that he was an original artist and has his place in the history of art, uh, whether as a great or minor artist, is up to the uh, individual. He, he, Nierendorf said you can't assess Crowley's art historically because it is bound up with an intriguing personality. And you must see Crowley's art as an extension of his self-projection. But it's very different, if you look at his work, to again to the image. He didn't paint pictures of black magic. He didn't. There's nothing perverse in his pictures. There's a kind there's a very uh, radical humor going on in some of them. And um, Terry Gilliam would be quite close in in the humor of uh, Crowley's art and his drawings. Um, uh, to, to some extent, although Gilliam's work, I remember when Monty Python first came out, people thought, it's disgusting, Ugh, it makes me feel sick, Ugh, horrible. And now <laughs> they say, you know, now, oh, the genius of Terry Gilliam and his Monty Python years, you know, all that. everything get Crowley eventually, I think, will be reassessed uh, and indeed assessed. I mean, I also, Sandra Miller, who's a historian of art at Southampton University, she says it's time that Crowley was considered seriously in the history of art. And I think that's that's exactly right. Far be it from me to say whether he, you know, is great or not. That some people like Max Bickman, some people don't. Some people like Nolder, some people don't. Some people like Schmidt Rottluff, some people don't. You know, whether whether you like Crowley's work, I like it. I think he had a fabulous sense of colour and expressiveness. 
and I find it, his work very refreshing and especially by its variety. He wasn't one of these people who found that you could be famous painting blue circles and then went on to paint blue circles for the next 50 years, slight variations. Um, no, Crowley always was after something new. I, my, one of my favorite ideas was his, his was called The Dream of Dead Hats. And he'd done this picture of a woman reclining, dreaming of hats. And the interview of the Syracuse news, newspaper in New York at the time said, well, what's this one? He said, well, don't you think that ladies often dream about dead hats? <laughs> it's a very surreal statement. It's wonderful. <laughs> and uh, it's not about horned ones and, and all this, the nice of the demon and all that. We could have another conversation on that, on the subject of Crowley's place in, in sort of hammer horror. And uh, or I say Crowley's misplaced <laughs> in the in the hammer horror. Perhaps one closing thought might be that, um, you know, you can look at life as your greatest artwork, really. And I think Crowley would certainly embody that idea. Yes, you've got it. That is it. The, the greatest art is the life you lead. And Crowley's gets more and more colorful and more and more interesting as the more we find out and honestly, honestly present him which is what I've tried very, very, very much to do, to show his voice as it really was and to remove the, the uh, impedimenta of decades of, of low-level um, bricks. Uh, what's the word? Mudslinging. Brick, brick bats. Yes. All of that. <laughs> Take that away and let's see where, how the man comes out. And we, we find not at all uh, the figure that uh, people imagine, but someone really rather, rather inspiring and humane and uh, definitely worth knowing about in our rather dull time. It seems a bit dull to me. Maybe it's just the weather today. Much going on, but somehow there is a sort of spiritual dullness in our era, uh, I think. Perhaps compared, perhaps I know too much of other eras. (laughs) Well, no, I think you're right on both counts, probably there. But, well, Tobias, today we've been talking about your latest book, as I say, it's called Alistair Crowley, The Beast in Berlin, Art, Sex and Magic in the Weimar Republic. That's available everywhere, but you perhaps tell people, um, I believe you've got another book out as well on William Blake. But tell, Comic, yes. tell people about that, uh, your website, because you also, um, you've made at least one film, you, know, you write music, and people <laughs> yeah. can find out all about that at your website. So share that and anything else you'd like to put out there. Well, I, I do have a, a has a, a limited presentation, a very limited presentation of my uh, life and work. Um, and and it's a slight inaccuracy. It says at the moment that I have two books out this year, uh, the Crowley book we've been talking about and my uh, fabulous, oh God, I shouldn't say that word, should I? Um, but I do. It's wonderful new biography of William Blake, the one that I wanted to read years ago. I finally got to write it. And, and it was supposed to be out this month. Uh, but due to publishing problems, it's going to be out in April with a forward by Michael Evis, the owner-director of the Glastonbury yeah, Festival, yeah, of course. who's come in behind it, uh, having read it. And uh, I tried to do what no one else has done with Blake before, which is not only make perfect sense of, 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 of the man, uh, but uh, not neglect the spiritual meaning and the philosophical depth uh, of, of his work. And uh, I, I'm, it's a good, it'll be out in April and all sorts of other things to come hopefully in that mysterious place called the future ah yes well as someone once said the future isn't now it's it's in a few minutes (laughs) (laughs) the future's already old (laughs) be here now said george harrison and he wasn't half right (laughs) (laughs) wonderful well tobias thank you so much for joining us today on legalizefreedom.com right i'm i'm all for it well folks that's it for another week As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is legalisefreedom.com. That's legalise-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programmes offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Based on current audience numbers... If everyone who tuned in donated just five pence per show, that's about eight cents US, this could become a full-time, fully funded operation, offering more and more often. During October 2014, over 50,000 of you streamed or downloaded at least one show. Total donations, 
or seven UK pounds, which currently converts to about eleven dollars US. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.